Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hate to break up what is obviously a very lively um, conversation going on. Um, welcome, um, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to um, the 2016 uh, John Curtin Medal Award uh, Ceremony. My name is Professor John Cordery, Provost at Curtin University, and I'll be your MC um, for this morning. Uh, before we commence our formal proceedings, can I please ask that you check that your mobile phones are switched off or placed to silent? Thank you. On other housekeeping matters, can I also draw your attention to the, the emergency exits, uh, which are at the rear, um, or at the side um, and in the front. Um, if there is an emergency, um, all guests should exit the building uh, via the nearest door and meet at the assembly point, which is on the forum, which is the large grassed area, which is outside. Now, would you please be upstanding while the stage party enters the theatre and please remain standing for the singing of the national anthem by Melissa Crothers. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. And, and thank you, Melissa, for that wonderful rendition of the National Anthem. I would now like to invite Lynette Mallard to uh, deliver the acknowledgement to country. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lynette Mallard, and I'm an Indigenous woman a Nyingana woman from the Kimberleys, and also got Nyinga um, identity also from my mother's side. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, the country in which we are having this ceremony today. This is Uja country, where Curtin University is situated and has belonged to the Wadja Nunga people for thousands of years. And it's now a place of learning for all people. So we respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional owners of this land on which we are meeting today. And we also acknowledge the contributions of Aboriginal Australians and non-Aboriginal Australians to the education of all children and people in this country we all live in and share together Australia. So on behalf of the Centre for Aboriginal Studies, uh, we would like to congratulate the recipient of the John Curtin Medal. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette Mallard. 2016 marks the 19th annual John Curtin Medal Award Ceremony. This year, we will once again be presenting the John Curtin Medal to an extraordinary recipient who has demonstrated John Curtin's attributes of vision, leadership, and community service. It now gives me very great pleasure to introduce Mr. Colin Beckett, Chancellor of Curtin University, to officially welcome you. Thank you for attending this year's John Curtin Medal Award Ceremony. 
I'd like to acknowledge our 2016 John Curtin medalist and her special guests. John Curtin medalists from previous years, former Vice Chancellor, Professor John Maloney, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for attending today. I wish to pass on apologies received from some of our former John Curtin medalists and members of the family of John Curtin. As many of you will be aware, the 7th of October marks the date that John Curtin was sworn in as Australia's Prime Minister in 1941. Born in Victoria in 1885, Mr Curtin moved to Perth in 1917 to become an editor of a trade union newspaper. And in 1928, he was elected as a member of the Fremantle in the House of Representatives. And in 1935, was elected the leader of the Parliamentary Labour Party and leader of the opposition. Curtin assumed the office of Prime Minister just six weeks before the bombing of Pearl Harbour and then Australia through some of the Night Nation's darkest days. He remains the only Prime Minister to represent a West Australian seat in the Federal Parliament. Due to the many burdens of office and within weeks of final victory, he died on the 5th of July 1945, aged 60. A crowd of more than 20,000 people attended his funeral in Perth. One of John Curtin's passion was education for all and how that education could benefit the community. The purpose of awarding the John Curtin Medal is to commemorate a great Australian Prime Minister after whom this university is named. As Curtin said, the great university should find its heroes in the present, its hopes in the future, and it should have ever thought. Today we are going to do, do just that as we award the John Curtin Medal to an outstanding recipient who shares Curtin's attributes of vision, leadership and community service. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. I would now like to invite Curtin's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Deborah Terry AO, to acknowledge some of our former medalists who are with us today and to announce the John Curtin Medalist for 2016. Thank you very much, John, and thank you, Lynette, for your warm welcome to country. Can I uh, acknowledge uh, Chancellor, Mr. Colin Beckett, former Vice-Chancellor Emeritus Professor John Maloney, our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Over the past 18 years, we've honoured many outstanding individuals with the John Curtin Medal. The full list of previous medalists is shown in your programs, and we're delighted to have one of them here with us today in the front row. I welcome Brother Ollie Pickett, a medalist in 2002, who has spent more than 40 years of his life helping others, including the underprivileged and the disabled. This work extends from his early days as a teacher and coordinator of work skill programs for at-risk youth to his current work that's focused on manufacturing low-cost wheelchairs for landmine and polio victims around the world. It's wonderful to have you here with us again today, Ollie. We were deeply saddened just a short period of time ago to hear that our uh, 2003 medalist, Doug Paley, recently passed away. Doug was the founding CEO of Food Bank WA. The organisation now feeds 53,000 Western Australians every month, having grown from an initiative that Doug initially ran out of his car boot. Doug had a very close association with the university providing community service opportunities for our John Curtin undergraduate scholars and for our Curtin volunteers. He was also a wonderful supporter of today's event, having attended the every John Curtin medal ceremony since receiving his own medal in 2003. So I'm sure you will all share with me the fact that we will miss Doug's enthusiasm, his passion and his enormous generosity of spirit. The John Curtin Medal is awarded annually by Curtin University to organisations and people who have made a very significant contribution in their chosen field in Australia or internationally and, as we've heard, who have exhibited John Curtin's attributes of vision, leadership and commitment to community service. <coughs> Earlier this year, we held our annual John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Anniversary Lecture <coughs> which is one of the other ways 
that we seek to acknowledge and embed the values of our namesake. This year's oration was delivered by commentator and journalist Sally Warhaft. <coughs> uh, the oration focused on what John Curtin might have made of the 2016 election campaign, a very meaty topic as I'm sure you can all imagine, and a comment made by John Curtin in one of his own campaign speeches in 1937 I think goes to the heart of what we're celebrating today. He, it emphasised his enduring commitment to social justice, a commitment that goes to the very heart of the achievements of our medalist that we will acknowledge this morning. He said, and I quote, the level of social wellbeing is the crucial test of economic policy and peace is an idle dream without social justice between nations and between individuals. We now have great pleasure in presenting this year's John Curtin Medal to an outstanding individual who has made a huge contribution in response to her own personal experience of what is a major social issue. Our John Curtin Medalist for 2016 is Dr Anne O'Neill, whose deep commitment to the pursuit of social wellbeing is truly inspiring. Dr Anne O'Neill's vision is for a safe and socially just society where people can live free of fear and violence and where social conditions and structures are supportive of victims of violence. This vision is born out of her own tragic experience of domestic violence. In 1994, Anne's estranged husband broke into her home while she was asleep, shooting her two young children, aged six and four, before shooting Anne and then turning the gun on himself. Anne was the only survivor, but suffered a severe injury, which resulted in the loss of her leg. Despite experiencing the unimaginable loss of her children and dealing with her own injuries, as well as scrutiny and victim blame by the media, Anne has channelled her grief into helping others. She's quoted as saying that we as a community have an obligation to make our community better. We can blame other people, but ultimately it's up to each and every one of us to do our bit to try and make society as just as possible. Just seven months after the tragedy, Anne commenced full-time study. She earned a degree in social work with first-class honours and a PhD in international health from Curtin University. Her PhD dissertation was a groundbreaking study of how secondary victims of serious crime are supported. She has since dedicated her life to assisting others through her social work through her advocacy, her research, her education and her public speaking. Just over a decade ago, she founded Angel Hands, a not-for-profit community support group dedicated to victims of serious crime. Angel Hands was the first web-based support group of its kind in Australia. Today it provides a range of programs to support the recovery of people affected by homicide and serious interpersonal violence and works to assert their needs within the wider community. As a convener of the first WA Homicide Victims Support Group, a voluntary organisation providing peer-to-peer -peer support for those who have lost a loved one, and is raising awareness of family violence and helping people cope with life after such violence. She's recently become an ambassador for Our Watch which was established to drive nationwide change in the culture, the behaviours and the power imbalances that lead to violence against women and their children. Their mandate is to stop violence before it occurs, a focus that aligns directly with Anne's own work. She also educates and assists government departments, organisations and individuals on issues of family violence, as well as how people can deal with trauma, stress and change in their lives and their workplace. As a public speaker, she's been recognised internationally through invitations to present in England, Croatia and the US. Although feeling for many years that she would never have another family, Anne has married and in 2013 celebrated the birth of a baby boy and it's lovely to have her family with her here today. I'm sure that you will all agree with me that Anne's extraordinary courage 
and her outstanding vision, her leadership and her community service make her a most worthy recipient of a John Curtin Medal. Thank you. through the Centre for International Health, where I was a senior lecturer. Anne's topic was a study of support available to secondary victims of homicide. The primary victims are the ones who are directly injured. Sometimes they lose their lives. But the secondary victims are those who may not be directly impacted by the homicide, but feel the scars of the homicide long after the homicide happens. I asked Anne uh, what motivated her in this choice of topic. That's when I realized that Anne herself had experienced incredible tragedy. She had lost her children to a homicide in 1994. Anne herself had suffered injury through that. Angel Hands is a not-for-profit organization that was set up by Anne and a friend who supported her during her early years of grief and building her own strength. It gives them support by giving them advice and case management, giving them an understanding of what they have to do to navigate the legal or the justice system. Angel Hands is always there for them. There's someone who will listen to them, who will talk to them, who will advise them. It's also an advocacy organization where it advocates on behalf of all victims and it does that to the government, both the state government and <coughs> national. Anne is a passionate advocate and excellent public speaker. This is because she speaks from experience. She speaks with strength and resilience and this comes out in her talks. Throughout the time of knowing her, she has continued her advocacy work, her training work, and her consultancy work, and she does that all over the world. To me, there's no greater pain than losing your children. And I think to overcome that and to rebuild your life is itself really difficult. It requires strength, immense strength. It requires resilience and it requires courage. The message in our story is that you can overcome adversity. You can overcome in spite of loss and pain and grief. And you can derive strength and resilience and give back that strength and resilience to others. And I now invite you to stand to receive your John Curtin Medal from our Chancellor. This award serves to reinforce the fact 
that our medalist has justly earned the respect and accommodation of the whole community. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you to you our 2016 John Curtin medalist, Dr. Anna O'Neill, and invite me to stand and join me in recognizing her outstanding. when I look at the list of previous winners and it's, it's quite surreal. Um, it would be remiss of me not to, to acknowledge distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm not going to go into names. I think we've covered that enough. But um, I will just um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we meet upon today, the Wujak people, and uh, Wujak Noongar people, and pay respect to their elders, both past present and emerging and draw attention to the incredible trauma in this community that remains largely unaddressed and we've got so much work to do in that area. When we look at homicide rates, this community is affected you know, just at rates that are terrifying. I think it's 16 times, in, 16 in every 100,000 Aboriginal people will be murdered. Um, Aboriginal women are, are around, the research varies between 35 to 45 times more likely to experience family and domestic violence and uh, the homicide rate compared in our non-Indigenous communities is 1.7 in every 100,000. So that gives you some idea of the massive work we've still got to do. So I almost feel like, you know, our work in this space hasn't even started. So. On the back of that, to say I'm humbled and honoured is, is an understatement because really this has been just a life passion that started as something to do when the world I knew changed and um, it's, it's just weird. I probably get emotional which is also weird for me because I don't usually, I was practising this morning and I thought what's this water coming out of my eyes? <laughs> so as I say, everything came out of um, a need. And what happened when I was in the hospital was I realised nobody really knew what to do to help me, not the professionals. Everybody had the best heart, the best of intention, but they didn't know what to do. I went back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and uh, I borrowed an adaptation by a Professor, or the Emeritus Professor John Taylor from New Zealand from his restorative justice work, which I've got on the screen here today. And it became really clear when I saw his slide why in this area of trauma support work, when somebody's basic human needs are not being met, everything else gets really wobbly really quickly. And throughout my PhD, I actually drew the analogy with the HIV virus, that you know, when you have a, a major trauma, just to reintroduce a little bit, of secondary victimisation or secondary trauma severely challenges people's well-being. And for me, I was lucky. I had lots of loving family and friends around me. Granted, they didn't know what to do, but they all did the best and we all supported each other on our, on our journey. But it was fascinating when I went to the library to actually see that all the books that were available on homicide were great big American glossy autobiographies and that's not to diminish the pain of the people who wrote them but it wasn't what I needed. I wanted to know how to get myself out of bed, how to get into the shower, you know, how to cope, how to help my family deal with what had happened, how to respond when people blamed me. I wanted, uh, you know, a, a survival guide and there was nothing. And uh, interestingly, I was probably one of those at-risk kids that uh, you know we also often hear about when I was young. And the thought of, of going back to school was something I'd committed to when I was 14. So I planned that and I continued that. And, and I'll talk a little bit about who, who encouraged me in those areas in a moment. But not to miss the true um, 
sort of synergy. I found this infographic. Don't you love that word? An infographic is such a wonderful thing. How our language evolves about um, trauma and its impact on people. And my whole PhD's work, my whole 22 years of survival and walking beside probably by now tens of thousands of people who have been traumatised is summarised in this graphic, the risks and the challenges they face. And when we look at trauma in Australia, between 50 to 75% of people will be exposed to a potentially traumatic event in their life. And because trauma is, is um, experienced through a perception of an event, not the actual entity of an event in itself, that's, that's why we call it a potentially um, traumatic event. But we know that half a million Australians live with PTSD in any one year and it's estimated that around 5% live with it in their lifetime. So it is a national and international epidemic according to the World Health. The cost of trauma hasn't even begun to be measured, particularly when you look at its impact on our physical health, our mental health, our wellbeing and our employment, let alone our housing and, and those secondary um, issues. But what we know from our research emerging in family and domestic violence is it costs around $21.7 billion a year currently for family and domestic violence and it's estimated that that will increase to $323 billion in the next 30 years if we don't do something. So whilst it's a social issue, it's also an issue of actually saving our economic community and our health. And it was this reason that I actually hadn't said I was a victim of family violence because I didn't live in a stereotypical relationship. A lot of the abuse I experienced was covert and largely um, unacknowledged. And in fact, I was told that my expectations of my first husband were far too high. So when we think about that, it's a, an interesting um, situation. So when I talk about why I do what I do to people who don't know me, I've recently come up with this model, and I call it my live, love, life model, which I think summarises me as well. But as a young woman, I lived with violent experiences, thus the live, and anybody who knows me, I love acronyms and quotes. So uh, thus, live is for living in violent experiences. Love, which is a word you can't use in parliament or uh, in business, um, plans, I'm told. It's, uh, it's actually not acceptable. Uh, so I slipped it in there in Angel Hand's business plan by making it into the acronym of learning to overcome violent experiences, which I've spent a significant part of my life doing and continue to. And then there's that part which is about life, and that's living in freedom of fear forevermore. And uh, if you wrap around that, my journey, the political the personal and the professional keep going around. There's a didactic, it never ends, it just keeps going. And hopefully I'll never have to know that violence again and no one in my family or my community or our community will ever know it. So my dream is that we can live free of fear, free of um, violence, and free of the pursuit of power over each other, that we can work as colleagues and move to more of a consensus model both in the social service sector and in, in our general lives. I think we've got such a high standard of living, we forgot what it's like to support one another so often. So in accepting this medal, I wish to dedicate it to all the people affected by violent crime, directly or indirectly, so many who have actually supported me in what I do, academically and vocationally. So if I use this above model that I've, I've mentioned, if I look at my live and my love supporters, then my family of origin. My dad. My sister, Amelia. My brother-in-law, Daniel, who couldn't join us to Julie and Alex, my cousin Kylie, through our childhood, they were my rocks. They taught me that there was a different way to be. My friends, Dawn, <laughs> Aki, Sue, Mo, 
Spectrum Jifco and the BBBs who will know who they are, they're not here today. I was lucky enough to have met you along my journey and you've supported me in ways that I've never known friendship to be in so unconditional. And it continues, that support continues to enable me to do what I do. But I probably wouldn't be able to keep giving sometimes up to 20 hours a day to Angel Hands without the support of the family I was lucky enough to marry into recently and become a part of five years ago. So Maureen, Matt, Sally, your support in all its different guises has been the thing that has allowed Wayne and I to continue to enjoy our family, but to continue the pursuit of that goal. So, my love mentors and teachers, my academic supervisors, Julie Dickinson, Dr. Judy Esmond, Dr. Jaya Ernest, the Curtin Divisional Scholarship from Health Sciences team who gave me the scholarship to do my PhD. You have all believed in my abilities often when I didn't myself. My social justice mentors, the late Jock Ferguson, Jim McGinty, Cheryl Edwards, Vanessa, Ross and Harvey. My professional colleagues, especially Kenny Crystal and Jennifer Gardner, you believed in me from the beginning and encouraged me to work in this area despite my ever-present fear and my lack of confidence. As I say, I hated social workers when I was young. I got asked to do a small gig about, two, actually it was two years to the day after the children died by Jennifer from the social work department here at Curtin. I got there, it was 600 people in a national conference. I thought, yeah, well, you told the truth there, didn't you, Jennifer? My trust issues went back. And uh, yet, yeah, it was amazing that people wanted to listen, they wanted to learn, and it inspired me to learn everything that social work stood for in its best embodiment. And uh, they got me through those four years of very hard work, despite all the physical challenges and operations that I had in that time. And then, of course, there's the team of people who've supported me during that love and live a life phase of learning. And Angel Hands would not have even come into existence if it hadn't have been for my honours thesis, which I did here, which was called Honouring Survival Is There a Rule Book? And I decided for my honours research I would write a narrative piece that was something that could be accessed from anywhere at any time that was a how to get up in the morning, how to know you were normal in the face of such an abnormal experience. So I did five in-depth interviews with secondary victims of homicide from all different scenarios so that people could pick it up and go, you know, I'm, I'm going to be okay, I can do this and for academics as well. And, and it was quite um, a shock to me when a UWA award was granted to me for that and that Grace Vaughan Award. And it was Fran Crawford who said to me, why don't you use that money and start a website? And the websites were just starting at the time and I thought, I don't know anything about technology. I can barely operate Word. <laughs> so I trundled off and met John, who's here with us today. And we sat around his back table and I'll probably be very unacademic and say we had a bourbon and a spa <laughs> <laughs> and Angel Hands was born <laughs> at the concept of John knew about IT. He then went and talked to his business partner David who's here with us today and between them they got a website up and running so that 24-7 anywhere in the world people could access information and as you've probably guessed I don't really like being the centre of attention so I put lots of other information on that as well so we could hide my stuff just where people could get it. It wasn't just about me. So ITLC continues to do all of our IT work pro bono to this day and we thank the team there so um, much. I, I don't know if you know, poor David's up at all hours of the night fixing things when we can't communicate with our clients. So thus we wouldn't even exist without those humble beginnings, nor would the 300 people plus, would it, would it exist without the 300 plus volunteers who have supported our work over the last 13 years. And the current team who've worked so hard to keep us going through these really tough economic times because funding is getting even harder to achieve. So 
Amy, Sadie, Julie, Fadina, Kevin, David and Yule. While I may be the figurehead of Angel Hands, you guys are the foundations on which he currently runs. And we are lucky enough to have the knowledge passed on to us from our other pillars of support who've moved on, which include Anita, Nicole, Kirsten, <coughs> Guy, and so many others who've served operationally and on our board. Together, we all contribute to the provision of trauma recovery support for about 300 people a year on a very measly budget. Um, our efficiencies are beyond anybody's scope, so if you're looking for a good social investment, <coughs> please do come and talk to me. I'm never going to miss a pitch. Um, but we, we really do offer a service that no one else goes to. We often have people who are considered to be quite unsavoury. They slip through the gaps. They're often considered to be mad or bad as opposed to traumatised. And uh, it's amazing what trauma can, can lead people to do when they don't know how to even trust somebody to meet their basic needs. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart. You helped me to learn, to grow, to strive to be the best that I can be. But most of all, you help people who've lost faith in the goodness of people to know that goodness remains a constant, even though they've been touched by its worst. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the people affected by violent crime who I've come into contact with. They've honoured me by trusting me with their faith in humans when theirs has been shattered. They've allowed me to walk beside them and to know their deepest, darkest, ugliest truth. They've trusted me to convey that truth and that ugliness in the best way I can to people who needed to know it when they didn't have time, they had other commitments, or they just didn't have the capacity. They have been my inspiration. When I think back to that first Homicide Victim Support Group meeting, I would never have done any of this if I hadn't have known this journey was so many other people's journey. I was okay, but too many people out there weren't. I couldn't end without coming to the man who has loved and supported me for the past five years. His conviction to social justice makes mine look really weak sometimes. <laughs> he pushes me to keep going when I want to give up. He looks after our little angel when I'm working day after day, hour after hour, when I'm tracking all over the country and goes above and beyond. And he makes <coughs> this world a safe space for me to have a life, and that is living free of fear. I never thought I would have that, so I thank you. And I thank all of you for this award, and I dedicate it to all of the homicide victims that I know personally, and there's actually five more since I lost my children. It happens far too frequently, and to any of you in here who have been touched by this, I honour it to you as well. Thank you. family and friends who are, um, are with us today. I know like um, we at Curtin University, you're all very proud of what are um, outstanding achievements. As in previous years, um, there is an extensive program of community service activities that are associated with this day, John Curtin Day. <coughs> the activities are coordinated by Curtin's volunteers through the university's Curtin Life um, area. It now gives me great pleasure to invite the president of Curtin Volunteers, Nafisha Akhtar, to tell us about the wonderful activities that have been or are about to be undertaken for John Curtin Weekend this year. Nafisha. Ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests, it is incredible to see how John Curtin's values of vision, leadership, and community service has been exemplified by our 2016 John Curtin Medalist. 
I extend my warm congratulations to Dr. Anna Neal. I feel privileged to be speaking to you today and I'm blessed to be surrounded by individuals <coughs> who share John Curtin's values and ideas around leadership and community service. My name is Nafisa and I'm speaking as the president of Curtin Volunteers. Curtin Volunteers, which is a student-driven volunteering hub alongside our very hardworking staff members, Mark Phillips, Christian Shah and Maureen Meredith. We offer a range of opportunities across Western Australian communities. Last year alone, we had over 900 volunteers from various backgrounds coming together as one to enhance the student experience and assist the wider community. Cairn Volunteers offers opportunities which involves working with schools <coughs> to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance with literacy and numeracy, assist individuals who come from a non-English speaking background with their conversation skills, and flying out volunteers to remote and indigenous communities to work on local community projects. Our largest community project is John Curtin Weekend, affectionately known as JCW. JCW started 17 years ago, initially as John Curtin Day, and now runs over six weekends in both metropolitan and regional areas across Western Australia, as well as, well as Sarawak, Malaysia, and in Singapore. Volunteers assist with projects chosen by the community, and this can range from assisting with local races, carnivals, events, restoration of sites that hold value to the community, and most importantly, activities that involve youth engagement. The slideshow behind me gives you an idea of what our volunteers do as part of JCW. This year we've had 42 sites and over 600 volunteers taking part in this project. The success of JCW is due to Maureen and Meredith in, on the third row here from the, from the back and her team of site leaders, volunteer bus drivers, interns and our volunteers. JCW would not come so far without the tireless amount of work from the CB team. When we serve in the community, we don't only have a positive impact on others, but we also grow as individuals. I found myself growing, not in terms of my height, unfortunately, <laughs> but in character. After every trip or volunteering session I've been involved with. The benefits of JCW go beyond the experience of getting out in the country and being involved. As a volunteering organisation, we support and encourage our students to take on these opportunities and experience issues faced in our society. I believe that we learn when we're active and when we take action and when we expose ourselves to situations that test our true selves. I also believe that the environment that we surround ourselves in helps shape our views and opinions and what better way to accomplish that by being stuck over the weekend with people you don't know in a town you're not familiar with. But to be honest, JCW is a great opportunity to put yourself outside your comfort zone and spend a weekend with like-minded people with the appreciation of being exposed in a foreign environment. In a situation like this, there's nothing much to lose because we can either win from it or learn from it. I commend all our volunteers on their effort, their time and the valuable experiences they've gained from, the community, from contributing out into the community. Our volunteers come from a mix of both international and domestic students. Without CV, very few students would get the chance to experience life outside of Perth. I honestly don't even know what took me this long to get outside of Perth and experience the country. I would like to remind everyone that we can get involved in making a positive change together. Through projects such as JCW, we aim to assist in producing more Curtin graduates to value <coughs> leadership, to be community minded, and to strive in doing the best once leaving university, like Dr. Anne O'Neill and our past John Curtin medalists. Through continuing the work we do, we look forward to inspiring more people to take action and confront important issues in the society that need attention and to become hope for the betterment for the future. Thank you.
Lisa, the amount of work being done by uh, Curtin volunteers this year is, is just outstanding. It's wonderful here to hear that uh, almost 500 people will have worked on projects across WA and in Malaysia um, as part of John Curtin uh, Weekend. Well, that concludes the formal part of the celebrations. I hope that you've all enjoyed um, celebrating the award of um, the John Curtin Medal um, today and uh, the ceremony. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attendance and invite you all to join us um, in, in a buffet lunch in the Brodie Hall atrium of the John Curtin Gallery directly outside this theatre. If you wouldn't mind now please standing for the departure of the stage party before leaving the theatre.